Hello everyone and welcome to the History Hotline, the hottest line for all things black history and beyond. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 64 of the History Hotline. My name is Deanna Lynn Cook and as always I will be your host today. So today we are going to be kind of carrying on from the topic of episode 63 which was Caribbean immigration into the US but we will be taking a little step further um, and looking at what that migration actually meant for not only Caribbean people in America, but also African-Americans that were already in America um, and were kind of faced with a new group of black people. Um, And the term black, African-American, Caribbean, Afro-Caribbean, which we're going to get into a little bit later, all kind of need clearing up, clarifying, defining, which we will do throughout this episode because you know, race, as we know, is a social construct. Um, And the way it socially constructed itself during like the early 20th century in the United States in regards to African American people, and then the Caribbean people, Afro-Caribbean, which means people of African descent from the Caribbean, as opposed to people maybe from Asian descent in the Caribbean, like uh, Indo-Guyanese people, um, because obviously there was a lot of people that would have come as indentured labourers to the Caribbean from places like India, from places like China. Um, So this kind of episode isn't necessarily focusing on their experiences um, because of the way that they would have been racialised in a different way to um, people of African descent in the Caribbean moving then to America. So, you know, bear with me, but had to make that distinction. Um, This episode will be in five parts and... The first one will be the waves of migration from the Caribbean to the US. We looked at like the history um, last episode. I'd say if you haven't listened to that already, you definitely should. Gives a good background to this one. Um, But we'll be looking at the different waves um, of kind of not forced migration. So going past people that were enslaved and came to um, America from the Caribbean in the 19th century um, and 18th century and kind of moving forward to the 20th century. Um, We'll also, the second section, we'll be looking at uh, the kind of Afro-Caribbean concept of race coming from the colonial Caribbean because Britain is still there as with the other European powers. Um, However, the migration pattern we're looking at is kind of from the Anglophone Caribbean countries, so countries that were colonised by um, Britain as opposed to, say, the French or the Dutch or the Spanish. Um, However, they might, you know, pop up. Uh, in later episodes. The second section, yep, Afro-Caribbean conceptions of race, and then we're going to look at the American conception of race, which is obviously not really defined by African Americans. Um, It's defined by white people in America who are the lawmakers, the former slave masters, you know, all of that. So we'll look at that as well. And then we'll get into the oppositional relations between the two. So how that those conceptions created tension between those two groups um, of people. And then the fifth one is um, the kind of impact that had on like housing, employment and the kind of real life workings of that relationship. And now you might be thinking, this is a bit of a different episode to what we used to. We obviously are not thinking about Black Britain today. Um, and that's because it is um, Black History Month in America. And I really like American history, especially how it relates to the Caribbean. So it's just something I'm interested in. And I guess what I'm interested in gets shared with you. Also, I will say I found the research for this episode really interesting because, um, and it's a conversation I was having with a friend actually recently about the fact that we always look at um race and kind of racial experiences of people in relation to whiteness Um, and whilst that will happen a little bit today we're kind of looking at it in relation to another group of black people um you know the caribbean people's experiences in comparison to those of african-american um descent origin or or labeling so it's not looking at necessarily the relationship with a white group of people and a black group of people we're looking at the relationship between two groups of black people which I think can be very interesting when you think about the way that people are racialized the way that race is used as a tool to oppress um, and then how that oppression kind of seeps down into these black communities and these black groups of people that are now um, navigating the same space in America. Um, we're kind of focusing uh, more on the northern states of America, 
Um, we'll get into why shortly, but that's kind of where this episode is focused, not so much the South, because migration there was a little bit different, um, and there was also um, a lot of African Americans actually leaving the South at that point, post-slavery, to better opportunities in the North, and a better kind of quality of life, and I say that in inverted commas, because, you know, obviously, um, there was no kind of safe haven for black people in America, there was racism everywhere. So that is the plan for this episode today. I hope you enjoy it and let's get into it. So Afro-Caribbeans were the overall majority of the 143,797 black immigrants to enter the US between 1899 and 1937. Now that's quite a wide time period Um, and 1899 is obviously post-slavery. Um, it's a reconstruction era in America, um, up to the early 20th century, um, up to 1937, which is just at the start of, well, two years before World War Two. Um, so this is the time period we're looking at, um, this real early part of the 20th century. So these waves, as I mentioned, there's three of them. Um, that's kind of how they've been labelled and termed. Um, the first one is that start of the time period I mentioned um, around 1899, which is the closing of the 19th century, the very early 20th century, um, and this is where the rate of growth for foreign-born black people was outpacing, actually, the rate of growth for native-born black people, and native-born black people would have been African-Americans, as well as native-born white people, um, so white Americans who would have been descendants of um, Europe, um, and then foreign-born white populations, so uh, other groups of people migrating um, more recently, Um, from Europe, probably from places like Ireland, Italy, um, you know, across Europe, essentially, but not obviously from generations ago, like quote unquote white Americans are. Um, The second wave um, of Caribbean migration begins in the 1930s. Um, However, historians have kind of labelled it more as a stream, um, as opposed to it being kind of a wave, whereas the third wave, um, which is in the 1960s, Um, Well, it begins there. That's called a hurricane wave because um, the proportions are just so large and can have actually continued to this day. Caribbean people are still migrating to the US in quite big numbers. Whilst it's a little bit more difficult to do now with some of the immigration acts and legislation and visa laws and, you know, um, you know, the former president and, and probably this one as well, although I haven't looked into his policies probably as much because have you noticed that? Since um, President number 45 has left office, we don't really hear as much about what's happening in America, um, which I'm very grateful for because, you know, we don't live there. But, um, yeah, I've noticed that, obviously, he was known for his kind of anti-immigration stance. So I'm not sure how that has impacted the waves of migration today. But um, the hurricane of the 60s um, has continued, shall we say. Um, New York now and then was the principal city of entry and settlement um, coming through Ellis Island Um, and apparently by 1930 57% of all Caribbean immigrants lived in New York which is obviously the vast majority. Um, New York is known for having um, Caribbean communities, Harlem being one of the main places. We mentioned Claude McKay who was um, an integral part of the Harlem Renaissance um, and He was obviously from Jamaica, Um, so there was a lot of art, literature, poetry, um, and just kind of creativity coming out of Harlem um, in the early 20th century. Um, And I think there's an episode due for that because it's such a cool period of time, I think. Um, And, yeah, so majority of people migrate into New York. However, smaller percentages of people migrate into places like Boston, Miami, uh, Tampa in Florida, And those um, migrations would have obviously seen, you know, large numbers of people from the Caribbean moving, which led to communities being built. um, And of course, some of the problems and the tensions between African-Americans that we're going to speak of later. Now, I mentioned before the Great Migration, um, which was actually the movement of African-Americans from southern states to the northern states um, and the northern cities, really. Um, because New York was perceived to be this kind of promised land, um, a mecca even, for people coming from the South, um, for African-Americans especially, 
um, because of the opportunities and I think just a I think racism has a different face in the northern states. Um, in the south, it's very there's Jim Crow, you know, there's very staunch, stark segregation. Um, it's a little bit less blunt, shall we say, um, in the northern states, and I think that's part of the appeal, as well as obviously, um, you know, employment prospects, um, work, which is obviously what people tend to move for. You know, economic factors are one of the main push factors um, for migration, even if it is, you know, from one place in the same country to the, to another. Although I will say. Moving from, like, the south in America to the north is, is... You may as well be in a different country because that place is so huge. I've never known anything like it. Um, Texas can fit the UK in it three times. So if, you know, that doesn't say how how big that one state is. And Texas isn't even the biggest state um, in America. So, yeah, a little tangent of the size of America. Um, however, the migrations that were happening to... Um, the northern cities, the New Yorks, the Bostons, the Tampas and Miamis, um, they weren't just of Caribbean people. This point I'm trying to stress. Um, there's also African-American people coming and they are also building community because they are in a new place. Even though it's the same country, you know, the rules are a bit different there. Um, and so that must be considered when we're thinking about how then the two groups interact and react to each other being in this space. So as I have said... Race is kind of conceptualised um, and it is constructed very differently um, in the Caribbean compared to the US. Um, and then Britain later on, when you think about it, um, you know, I think I've done an episode on um, can race being a social construct. Um, I would suggest listening to that if you haven't already. I think it will clear up and, and give good context for some of the things I might carry on and say. Now, um yeah, race is socially, politically, culturally constructed um, to distinguish people um, and to put people into different boxes and to sometimes, like, um, you know, ascribe different um, behaviours to them or expectations or stereotypes. Um, and it defines people along things like national origin, religion, language, food, culture. Um, or, you know, other cultural markers, wherever they might be relevant. Um, however, um, and it's Milton Vickerman who argues this point that race and ethnicity are conceptualised very differently in the Caribbean to the US, which I've obviously said. And this is in um, an article, actually, where he's been cited in Black in America 2, Afro-Caribbean Immigrants by Oswald Warner, which came out in 2012 and is just so helpful at like kind of detailing these migrations and also looking at the theory behind these racial constrictions, which I'm not going to get too far into because it's, I mean, part of it's going over my head, let alone um, the rest of listeners um, and the audience. And it's not really all that relevant in terms of understanding the experiences um, of people that migrated, essentially. However, we've got to note that the way that race was conceptualised and constructed is important to the treatment of these people. Now, in the colonial Caribbean, there is um, a, and I quote, um, from Gordon Lewis, um, who kind of coins this term, a multi-layered pigmentocracy. Now, Big words, big words that are going over my head. So a pigmentocracy, um, pigment, obviously skin pigment, um, and the idea that if you are of a lighter skin, you are of a higher, higher social standing in society. And if you are of a dark skin, you are um, lesser. Um, and it being multi-layered, meaning it's literally not just your skin colour then. Um, it Things like your hair texture, things like your class, um also kind of have an impact into this multi-layered pigmentocracy. Um, and this is obviously based on the fact that in the Caribbean, um, there was um, a slave-based society um, and that constructed society's understanding of race um, enslavement. Um, so in, you know, the colonial era, people were kind of approximated, if you were closer to European features and standards of beauty, with skin, hair, facial characteristics... Um, you would be higher status, essentially, because you would have been 
quote unquote closer to whiteness and further away from blackness. Now, in kind of a more modern uh, manifestation of this multi layered pigmentocracy, you get things like colorism. Um, where people of um, a lighter skin tone will get preferential treatment over people with dark skin tone in a variety of ways and then always just clean cut to, you know, covert racism or overt racism. It's a little bit more subtle than that um, and something to get into in a different episode, I would say. Um, However, in today's episode, the consequence of that um, and this idea of this pigmentocracy Um, And this is an interesting point that I read, um, but it comes from arguments by Franz Fanon and um, W.E.B. Du Bois, who speak about the kind of psychological damage um, of this kind of perception of being darker skinned being a negative thing. Um, It's a negative racialization, and they speak about that, as I said, the psychological damage of that in their work. And I find it quite interesting because Winston James, who's cited in this article that I read um, by Oswald Warner, um, he says a somewhat subconscious element of self-doubt, if not self-contempt, afflicted the African section of the population during and after slavery. So there's this kind of idea of like self-hate and self-loathing because of, um, you know, your black skin um, that would have been passed down through the system um, of this pigmentocracy in the Caribbean. Um, And he also goes on to say um, that, you know, even though there's an eventual rise of an educated black middle class in the Caribbean um, that gained political power, um, there's still this kind of colonial legacy of colorism. um, And that impacts this perception of social mobility, upward social mobility and being able to kind of succeed economically and socially in life. Um, And so this idea of a pigmentocracy is very different to how Americans conceptualise race. Now, I don't know if anybody remembers, um, I can't actually remember if I said it on an episode or if I've just been thinking about this a lot. But in the Caribbean, you know, if you were literally, if you were mixed race, for example, you were had a black parent and a white parent, you would be a mulatto. Um, And then there was a name essentially for every percentage of blackness you could be. If you were a quarter black and three quarters white, there was a name for that. If you were a quarter white and three quarters black, there was a name for that. Down to like a 16th and a 32th of like whiteness or blackness. There was a name for every stage in that, which shows that in comparison to America, when we think about this one drop rule, where if you have one drop of black blood, you are black, even if that one drop is literally from 99 generations ago. Um, And even though you might literally navigate the world as a white person, you are said to be black. Um, Obviously, you can get away with it if you maybe are white passing. And I believe there's a show on Netflix about that, which I need to watch. It looks really good. But the point is, these um, conceptions of race are very different, where you've got kind of every shade of brown being labelled um, and I'm sure there would have been a set of kind of stereotypes or perceived behaviours for each kind of group of people whereas in America like you've got one drop of black blood and you're black um, and I think in society today we've taken on this American idea of blackness a little bit with this kind of one drop and people claiming to be black with kind of a parent or grandparent all the way up um and that's not necessarily a bad thing that is just to highlight the fact that race is a social construct and it isn't something that's like a binary that's fixed because depending on where you are in the world is kind of how you'll be defined essentially so as i've kind of mentioned my structure is going out the window you know i really tried but we're on to the american conceptions of race now which was section number three of this podcast today um but we've already touched on the fact that there is a one drop rule essentially um and racial identification legally you know race is cemented into legal um jargon dialogue you know if you have one drop this is an actual rule and a law um and then segregation again that's a rule and a law Um, in order to, and I quote, maintain the supposed um, pureness of the white race by socially separating it from all people who have a single drop of black blood, whether they are mixed race, biracial, full full black. Um, 
yeah, so segregation is obviously established then um, in order to, quote unquote, protect whiteness. Um, and, you know, in some states in America, you could not marry um, someone that wasn't the same race as you or date them or have children with them. Um, and this is obviously really highlighting how fixed race was there, maybe a little bit more so than in the Caribbean. Um, and also a really important point now in the Caribbean, black people are a majority. They were a majority, even during the period of enslavement. They have always been a majority. However, in the US, black people are not a majority. And now that has an important impact on the people coming from the Caribbean, because in both situations, they have limited power, even with a Caribbean black majority or a minority. Um, they are a social um, minority with little to no political, social, economic power, both groups. Um, and I think this is an interesting point of how that then manifests in America. Um, and there is a historian called Nancy Fona, who's written a lot about Jamaican migrations, Caribbean migrations to the US. Um, but she notes that for the first time, West Indians have become acutely and painfully aware that black skin is a significant status marker and they actually become black in America and also in Britain. Um, if you want to think about later generations that would have moved to Britain, um, Caribbean people coming over came over as Jamaican, Trinidadian, um, Bayesian, Bahamian. They came over as the people of their nation. Their nationality was, you know, the most important. Yes, they were British subjects, British citizens, but they would have been from whatever country they came from. And that's how they would have defined themselves because, you know, someone from Trinidad and someone from Jamaica, they're not just going to be like, yeah, yeah, we're all the same, we're all black. That's not how it went. That's how it works now a little bit because this idea of being black British is so much more defined. But back then they would have defined as Jamaican, Guyanese, Trinidadian. And so when they get to America, they are black. Nobody is checking for where they come from. They don't really care at the end of the day because one drop of black blood, you're black. End of conversation. Um, and so I think we have to kind of remember that these, whilst well, African-Americans have, have dealt with that their whole life in America, um, coming over as enslaved Africans, they have always been othered as black. In the Caribbean, they are not othered. White people are othered because white people are the physical minority and whilst they might have not necessarily been you know the white man they would have been oh the English man the maybe the French man you know they were the other group of people so now for Caribbean people to come to America and be othered alongside African Americans is part of the kind of issue and where these opposition relations and tensions begin and now for our fourth section oppositional relations um, between the two groups. So there were a few factors as to why there were tensions, shall we say, between the newly arrived Afro-Caribbeans and African-Americans. Um, now, there was a stigma um, with African-Americans um, and the stereotypes that were perpetrated about them by white America um, was actually internalised by the first generation Afro-Caribbeans that came now, they believed that to kind of associate with them and identify with them would actually lead to a status reduction for them because African-Americans were treated so poorly. Um, and so, in a way, it was, I guess you could call it a survival technique of not associating with the group that is at the bottom um, of society's pecking order. Um, and that is why, that was one of the reasons essentially why they would not kind of associate, it was a fear of identification and there were instances of Afro-Caribbean people, you know, dressing very Caribbean, <laughs> essentially, and, and not the Caribbean you know today, I mean, in like flowing shirts and flowy trousers and hats, because that could distinguish them um, different to African-Americans and African-American fashion. There were also instances of them having extra pronounced British accents 
um, which they would have had anyway, because obviously colonised by Britain, um, the education system was set up for them to be little mini Brits, um, immersed completely and wholly into empire and Britishness. But they would emphasise that when they got to America. You know, obviously African-Americans would have an American accent, maybe even a southern drawl from when they have migrated, if they were part of that great migration. But Afro-Caribbeans would have really pushed the British accent, some of them, obviously not all, to distinguish themselves um, separate from uh, African-Americans. Now, on the flip side, African-Americans weren't always willing uh, to incorporate Afro-Caribbeans into their kind of world due to the scarce resources, and that is stuff like housing, um, employment, education, and it created competition because there was already a shortage of people that would employ somebody with melanin. Um, And so they didn't really want the added competition from Afro-Caribbeans who were, for the most part, you know, if able to migrate, sometimes coming from the middle classes of the Caribbean um, and most likely educated and potentially even seeking higher education in America, um, going to probably a HBCU, um, which is a historically black college or university, um, for anyone not aware. Now, this created a complex, I think, and a complicated relationship because Looking back, I think the moments of triumph with this relationship are the moments where we see people like somebody like Malcolm X, who is descendant of a Grenadian and an African-American, you know, really rallying and putting this little race, not even a racial division, is it? It's like a national ethnicity division um, aside to essentially just fight for black people, what we know now as black people. And it wasn't to say that um, Caribbean people were saying, oh, I'm not black or anything like that. That's just not the way that they were racialized. So to be in a place like America and then being called black and labeled as lesser um, was obviously not something that they were just going to take. So in turn, African-Americans would happily create boundaries um, and then kind of caricature and racially categorize um, people from the Caribbean. Um, And I think it's Kirsten Myers and Passion Williamson that have kind of noted this. Um, as kind of objectifying and dehumanising people, immigrants that would have come to America. And this is also seen with people from Africa that migrate in different kind of waves and at different time periods, um, assuming themselves superior to all other black people in the diaspora um, and adopting this kind of worldview that white Americans have um, and this American exceptionalism and the idea of that. Um, You know, I won't read the slurs that are used because it's just not the place um but essentially these like markers um of race they become a boundary that uh, african-american people use to kind of again differentiate and distinguish themselves from afro-caribbeans and then later on um, african people as well um different slurs uh different time periods but still the same effect now Essentially, as we've said, Afro-Caribbean immigrants didn't racially identify with African-Americans um, because, uh, and it is um, Milton Vickerman, who we've mentioned before, um, who writes a lot about this this topic. He um, argues, and I quote, their whole history and culture, um, that is African-Americans, um, acts as a counter pressure, again, conceptualising the world in racial terms. Um, and he argues that it's focused race is focused on a lot um whereas in the caribbean um the idea that things like material wealth educational advancement are more important than social issues such as racism so in the caribbean you know the fight was to get an education so you could have that upward social mobility whereas african americans and, you know, rightly so, because of the racism they were faced with, would focus more on social issues such as racism. Now, this is obviously um, Vickerman's theory, his idea, not to say I 100% agree with that or find it to be true, um, but that is just a kind of alternative opinion on the reasons for kind of these boundaries and divisions and the different mindsets the two groups of people would have had. So, very interestingly, um, for our final section, looking at the workplace and employment, Um, and housing slightly um, to see kind of how these two groups navigated each other. Um, Now, many Afro-Caribbean women actually found work in the garment industry during the First World War, and they dominated in the kind of skill tasks, 
more than African-American women. Um, However, male um, skilled workers and professionals were unable to find work. And so they would establish businesses, which creates this kind of class of Caribbean people who are entrepreneurial um, and own shops and small businesses in the local communities. And the local communities were obviously not just serving Afro-Caribbean people, they were serving African-Americans as well. And so they found themselves actually tied to and being economically dependent on African-American communities, because say if you have, I don't know, a food shop in um, a quote-unquote black area, you wouldn't just be serving Caribbean people. Caribbean people aren't there in the big enough numbers for that. So you would be serving African-American people because white people aren't really going to be about that. There's still a kind of segregatory spirit, shall we say, even in the North. Um, And essentially, um, this meant that the two had to navigate these spaces together and they had to coexist even if they were trying to distinguish themselves from one another. Um, However, this meant that fields like retail, publishing, politics were actually quite successful in black communities, um, especially driven by Afro-Caribbeans. Interestingly, it is stated that actually by 1930, 40% of MDs, so doctors, um, who are black in America are West Indian, um, and they were only actually one point between 1.2 and 1.5% of the population. So the fact that they were like disproportionately overrepresented in a field like medicine, which is obviously a very professional role, rely relies on a lot of um, education, um, degrees to be in that field. Um, they were kind of taking up space in the professional world, um, Afro-Caribbeans, um, particularly medicine, as I mentioned, dentists, lawyers, um, and the majority of black people in these roles were, quote-unquote, foreign-born. Um, unfortunately, um, I, I say unfortunately because I just don't like the terminology and the term of it, um, this early generation of successful Afro-Caribbean immigrants became known as black Jews, Um, which I find very interesting and it kind of relates to the prosperity economically of Jewish people in America um, that has been seen Um, so yeah I don't I really I don't like comparison between groups of people I just feel like it's not needed um, or fruitful Um, and it feels a bit slurry also but at the end of the day um, Afro-Caribbeans were in professional spaces um, and enterprising in the first generation that is of people within um America. And even more interestingly, um, the kind of employment spaces where African Americans and Afro Caribbeans actually kind of work together for the betterment of both groups of people um, were in regards to women. Um, Women from both groups, both groups of women would have struggled in regards to employment um, and they were both said to be active in unions. Uh, in order to kind of be part of that struggle to have better employment. And then as, you know, second, third generations of Caribbean people kind of grow and live in um, the United States, the kind of movement for the liberation of all black people with things like the Black Power Movement increase their kind of cooperation, shall we say. Um, There's actually a poem by Langston Hughes um, called Brothers, And it goes, you know, we are related, you and I, you from the West Indies, I from Kentucky, we are related, you and I, you from Africa, I from the States, we are brothers, you and I. And so there was actually, you know, a cultural move for some more unity with black people um, in these spaces at that time. Um, And just to end with a positive, um, because at this time, it was actually um, African, African Caribbeans that would have become some of the most radical leaders um, for the black cause in this period because of the kind of way they'd been racialized, um, they saw themselves as inferior to absolutely no one, especially white Americans. So this idea that white Americans might have been treating them as lesser, um, it wasn't going to go down well with them. Um, and it's this point where you get this group of highly educated Afro-Caribbeans that some of them are struggling to find work um, forming groups um, in order to push for racial equality. Um, people like Marcus Garvey, who started the Universal Negro Improvement Association, comes from Jamaica, um, you know, is active in America and also Britain in later life. Um, and there are actually 
a large group of people that are less famous, I would say, to me anyway. Um, and I'm going to read some of their names out um, if you are interested in ever researching a little bit more about any of them. Um, Grace Campbell, Elizabeth Hendrickson, Herb Harrison, um, and Cyril V. Briggs, uh, Ashley L. Totten, Frank R. Crossway. And to end with a quote from Kelly Miller, who is quoted having said that a radical was an overeducated West Indian without a job in America at that time. So there we go. Um, a little summary of the relationship between Afro-Caribbeans, um, people coming from the Caribbean, from the Anglophone Caribbean and African-Americans in some of those northern cities in America, especially New York, um, in the early 20th century. So I hope you enjoyed that episode. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening, and I hope you have a wonderful week. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to the History Hotline. If you've enjoyed this episode, please tell a friend to tell a friend. To continue the conversation about black history, head over to our social media platforms at the History Hotline on Instagram and at the History HL on Twitter.